Good evening, everybody. I'm Usha Srinivasan, and welcome to Hummingbird Circle, Ohlone Voices. This is the first of a three-part series uh, that will feature uh, Native American Ohlone culture bearers and artists. And we are pleased to bring this program to you in partnership with the Confederation of Ohlone People and uh, San Jose Museum of Art and Montalvo Arts. And this is a project that was funded in part by SV Creates and California Arts Council. Before we dive into the program, I'd like to invite Ohlone culture bearer Greg Castro to lead us through prayer and song. Uh, greetings to everyone out there in uh, the virtual land and the real land. Uh, my name is Greg Castro. I am uh, Rumson and Ramatush Ohlone and Totra Salinen. And I am very honored to be here and to be asked to uh, start this off in a good way as I've been taught. Creator, at the beginning of the world, you brought us here and had the first people ancestors teach us many things about this world you brought us to. And the first thing you taught us was to be grateful. Be grateful for this gift of this world you brought us into and to teach us to take care of it because it was gonna take care of us. And for thousands of years, we took care of it on a daily basis. And we loved the land and each other and it took care of us for a very long time. And in recent years, it has been more difficult to do that but we have never forgotten our responsibilities and sacred obligations to this gift you have given us. And so we're thankful that we are still here. We are thankful for the sacrifices and gifts of our ancestors and elders who led us to this place. And we continue to work to take care of this place you've given us. The land has changed and yet it is still our place. And we are still here and we are here to take care of it in whatever way we can. And so we thank you again for this beautiful gift of a world and this beautiful day that we are here uh, brought together to share our culture. And I'm gonna try to sing a song here and we'll see how this works. Ara pa chitia hoan was sia hiem. 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 Oh, that was the fog song of the Rumson people. And I sing it nowadays to clear the fog from our minds and our hearts. When we come together, we come to share, we come to learn from each other. I hope to learn and expect to learn much from this evening. And so I wanna clear the fog from my mind and my heart so I can listen open and full hearted. And I hope you do too. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Greg, that was beautiful. Um, before we get started, I'd like to offer a little bit of background on why we embarked on this project with the Confederation of Ohlone People. As uh, most of us know and experience, even as America becomes more diverse, we are actually less integrated. We tend to live, eat, play, pray in our own cultural silos, some of us feeling more American than others. And obviously this leads to an erosion in a sense of national identity, as well as the social fabric. At Mosaic Silicon Valley, our mission is to help strengthen diverse American communities and create a sense of belonging. And we believe that that can happen if we accomplish three things. If we create shared experiences among people in a community, we share a sense of a common future, a vision for the future. And very importantly, we also have a shared understanding of the past. 
And that is what we are here for today. November is Native American History Month. It's also Native American, it's called Native American Indian Heritage Month. But what we know about Native American history and culture is viewed largely through the lens of the destruction of the culture due to colonization or genocide. But the truth is a lot more complex than that. And yet what we learn from textbooks tends to be inaccurate, incomplete, rife with myths and mis misperceptions. And so we believe that the best way to kind of lift the fog, as Greg says, um, is to allow those authentic Native American voices to speak for themselves with the help of culture historians, culture documentarians, and just allow them to tell us, lead the way. In this effort, um, this is a pro project that has been jointly um, commissioned and produced by Mosaic Silicon Valley with the Confederation of Ohlone People. But the series that we are presenting to you today and the next two episodes that will come in the months to come, we are pleased to partner with San Jose Museum of Art and Montalvo Arts, two partners that are very dear and near to us. And I'd like to invite um, both of, um, we, I'd like to first invite Sayer Baton, who is the executive director of the museum, San Jose Museum of Art, to say a few words. And then Kelly Seacat, who is um, the director of the Lucas Arts Artist Program at Montalvo Arts. Sayer. Thank you so much, Usha, and Mosaic Silicon Valley for inviting the San Jose Museum of Art to be a part of this gathering tonight. And thank you, Greg, for opening this convening. Mosaic Silicon Valley's focus on connecting community really aligns with our core values at SJMA, to work collaboratively and present cross-disciplinary programs that highlight the cultural producers in San Jose and Silicon Valley, and we've been so fortunate to begin a long partnership with Mosaic Silicon Valley and open our doors to their unique vision. After presenting a collaborative program just last year, I wrote Usha and Priya a thank you note. And I was so touched when Priya wrote back, she wrote, there was a moment in late 2019 when I was walking up the steps of the museum when I was filled all at once with a quiet certainty and warmth, it dawned on me that I was feeling that I was coming home. Home, she put in quotes, for an immigrant, personally speaking, and for a small organization that is always a moving target and therefore that much more valued when found in however shaped and sized slices. So thank you, Priya, for those beautiful words. Tonight, we join in collaboration with the culture bearers of the unceded land where the museum is located. And we look forward to hosting more events at the museum when we are all allowed to gather again. Our partnerships value cultural stewards and we look forward to this presentation tonight in a moment to listen and to learn. So thank you, Usha. Kelly? Yes, I want to join Sarah in thanking Mosaic Silicon Valley and inviting us to join the Hummingbird Circle. It's a project we've been excited to learn about as it was growing and developing over the last years, thinking about ways that Montavo could extend its 175 acre public park to support the Ohlone people and support the programming of the community. For Montalvo, our mission is really about engaging the public in the creative process and bringing people into a shared exchange of art and cultures. And the Ohlone are such an important part of our community and underrepresented. So like Sarah, we're looking forward to the time when we're outside of COVID and we can come together. And for tonight, I think that idea of lifting the fog, the fog from our hearts, the fog from our minds and just spending time here together learning. So thank you. Thank you for organizing. Thanks to the museum for being here. It's a terrific project. Thank you so much. And with that, I'm going to turn over to my partner in crime at Mosaic, Priya Das, uh, who will then introduce our collaborators from uh, Confederation of Ohlone People. Enjoy. Um, and please do participate in the question and answer session. Uh, feel free to type in your comments. We would love to make this as interactive as possible. Priya? 
Yes, hi. Okay. I'm going to now uh, get Charlene to come on with you as well. Sayer, thank you. I did write that note and it was heartfelt at that time and it continues to be a home for us, for me personally, and for us at Mosaic Silicon Valley. Thanks so much. So I wanted to talk a little bit, uh, extend, um, expand a little bit on uh, what Usha talked about, uh, Mosaic Silicon Valley's programming. Um, the way we work is essentially our goal is to bring communities together. And each of our episodes, each of our events is the first in a series of handshakes with various cultures and various communities. We have chosen to do this over the last four years via arts and thus we have worked with folkloric artists to reach out to our, uh, the Mexican Americans among us. We've reached out to Indian folk artists to reach out to the Indian community, so on and so forth. But like I said, each of our events is the first in a series of handshakes. And therefore I'd like, love to welcome Charlene Vasquez, who is the ex-chairperson of the Confederation of Olonoi People. Charlene, I think we first met maybe 18 months ago. And uh, that's when Charlene, uh, we had her um, over to do the land acknowledgement uh, and prayer for one of our events. And that's when she told us, you know, people don't realize, uh, people think of the Ohlone and the Native American people as a thing of the past, but we are among you. And that's when Usha and I looked at each other and we said, we have to work with this community, with these cultures and, and support them in any which way we can. So this, what, we are, what you're experiencing today as a Zoom event was supposed to be part of an actual offline event at St. James Park in San Jose, California in April of this year. And that is right around then when uh, social distancing was announced. And since then we've stayed in touch uh, with Charlene and through her with the Ohlone community members to see how and when we could bring this, uh, their culture and their learnings and their efforts to a larger audience. And today, like Usha said, this is the first in a series of three that we will bring to you. Charlene, uh, could you just introduce yourself and uh, what, we, what we will be watching for the next um, six, seven minutes? Sure. So na my name is Charlene Eigen Vasquez and I had uh, started as she, as Priya mentioned, the Confederation of Ohlone People um, probably nearly 20 years ago. And the idea was to bring together um, Ohlone people that were learning about their culture, um, tracing their heritage, um, just exploring um, and people that were allies of the Ohlone people who were trying to help with land protection and preservation and policy issues. And that was the goal. And it's turned into much more. Um, but today, <clears throat> I'm happy to be here with you. Um, Priya mentioned that we, we organized an event that was supposed to happen <laughs> um, this past April, and it was supposed to be an outdoor event in San Jose. And one of the components of the event was going to be a show of the photographs taken by Ruth Morgan. And um, the sharing of some of the interviews that were um, collected by uh, Janet Klinger, and you'll hear more from them in a little bit. And so we're going to show you a video of some of the photos that were taken. And what I will say is that the entire project um, took over 17 years, I think is what we decided. And from the project, two books were created. One was released in 2004, and it was a bit of a booklet. Um, with about 10 elder, um, 10 people, eight or nine elders, plus some supporters. And it was their portraits. They're the direct dialogue of the people that were interviewed. And then it was published. And then those pictures were showed um, in galleries, in libraries, and different locations. Part two of the project took place around 2013. It started and it ended with um, a nice showing of uh, photos and more interviews. And between the two projects and the two books, we have over 500 pages of interviews and photos that were published. 
And so what I'll say about this particular project is that it's really just a small sample of all of the hard work that was done. So take that with just a little bit of a grain of salt. The other thing I wanted to explain is that one of the conveners of the project was Emery Sayers, and she couldn't be with us here today, but we did get an interview, an audio interview um, of the pro her perception of the project and how it came about in her words. And so you'll hear her voice over in uh, the short video that we're gonna show you. The other person speaking will be Catherine, who you'll meet in a little bit. And then Cassandra Dijon, who was only 10 years old when the first project began. Now she's a mother of a four-year-old and she gets the chance to talk a little bit about her experience and around the project and the importance of the project. And then finally, at the very end, what I will say is you'll hear some children singing. These, this recording took place probably about three or four years ago. And I just thought that it was appropriate to add that particular song and little conversation because it reminds me of the future and their desire to learn and their desire to instruct each other just to get it right. And you'll see what I mean when you hear the song. So enjoy the photo show. All right, I'll begin that uh, in five seconds. And then Charlene and I will come back um, to take you through the rest of the program right after this video. My name is Anne Marie Sayers. I'm a tribal chairperson of the Indian Canyon Nation, which is located uh, 15 miles south of Hollister. And it is the only federally recognized Indian country for 350 miles from Santa Rosa all the way down to Santa Barbara on the coast of California. And <clears throat> we've opened it up for all indigenous people globally, so they have a place, traditional lands that has always been held by the original people for a ceremony. Awesome. And what, a, what about the other efforts of continuing the Ohlone women elders, restoring a California legacy? Has that continued? It's been absolutely outstanding. Awesome. Um, anything going forward? I'm 72 years old, Canyon. <laughs> I just want my body to go to go forward, okay? Anything you would support others in continuing this? Oh, by all means. What would you like to see? The children really appreciating their culture and the knowledge that the original people had and have now, and many don't even realize it. I think of Anne Marie, uh, you know, when we were all making the necklaces for the, the elder women, you know, um, every shell is a prayer. And so those photographs are prayers. Mm. And the documentaries that I've made about our community of bridge walkers and witness the healing, um, I tried to approach it that way. Um, when I sat down to do the work was to see it as uh, a prayer. And so I think that those photographs are traveling around and um, 
like you were saying before, uh, w you know, reminding people who uh, the Ohlone are, and not just in the past, but today, and to see the, wow, to see the Shell Mound in Berkeley be recognized as a national historical site, it's beautiful. That one, uh, there was a lot of different people that were there. They had a lot of different speakers. Um, and I remember when they actually unveiled the pictures and allowed everyone to go through and see it. It was a really big deal to see everyone and be able to read about the information from the interview, um, from their little picture, um, like interview. I'm not sure if it was like an interview, but they put like a little caption with each person that they took the picture of um, for all the different elders. And it was just really cool to be able to actually learn about them a little bit more than what we are used to seeing, which is just them, you know, at the ceremony or passing along their stories. It was there for everyone else to see, not just us and our small little community. Okay. And um, when you think back at something like that, an activity like that, what what does it make you think about? Like the value? Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. The value of an activity like that? Um, well, I definitely love going to everything like that just because it brought everyone together, um, not only for, you know, the the alone people who went through and actually had their gather gatherings, but it also invited the community to be able to learn more about cultures that they may or may not have even known were there, um, as well as being able to know that, you know, that the only people are still there and that that is their, that's where they're from. And so a lot of people didn't know anything about it. So being able to have just normal. Oh, little baby, don't you cry. Daddy's gonna buy you a hummingbird. No, Daddy's gonna show you the evening sky. Daddy's gonna show you the evening sky. And if the hummingbird It's gonna show you the evening, the morning. Nah, -uh. it's not. -uh. When I first saw this video, Charlene, thanks so much for putting together, putting it together. I had tears in my eyes because I could totally see what you were saying about it started in 2003, and then we could see the same participants in 2013, and it kind of talked to the sheer effort, will, um, spirituality that went into this project. Um, you want to talk a little bit about this and then can I talk about our Zoom session with uh, Ruth and Janet? Sure. It, it's pretty crazy, but it's really hard to um, share the impact that this project had as it was happening, partly because, well, just the gathering of the people. <clears throat> so gathering of the elders in the very beginning, um, having been part of that and part of the honoring ceremony that went around, um, that particular um, part of the project was just, you know, amazing, and I can't really explain it. But the the thing that I wanted to talk about um, that we can't really show on our computers, no matter how big our screens are, are the first set of pictures that you saw that were black and white um, were life size pictures that were framed and beautifully mounted, and they were also done with um, film, real film, if people remember that, in a real dark room. So to have the skills to be able to create those incredible photos is just amazing. And I think unless people do real photography these days, and I know there's a, there are a number of people that do, um, it's kind of hard to appreciate what it takes to uh, develop film, to print pictures, and to get it just right. So that's one part of it. And then the other part I think that it's hard to um, share over video is just the excitement that people felt when they saw their pictures, huge and everybody, it's not about looking at your picture, but it's about the people that are enjoying the, the show. Because if you're the per a person and you're the subject of a picture and somebody says, so do you wanna take, can I take your picture? You kind of wonder why, like, why do you wanna take my picture? But then when you see it and people are enjoying it, then that makes so much more sense, you know, the, the importance of that. The second set of pictures that were in color, again, they were life-size pictures. 
um, the unveiling was at the San Francisco Library. And those were digital pictures. And so the, just kind of, you could, number one, if you saw the pictures, you could probably manipulate the pictures themselves differently. So they came out differently. And then the crowd was different because it was in a much different location than the first set of pictures. So that's just something to think about. The other thing that I think about when we were putting these together is the fact that some of the people that were in the first set of the pictures, some of the women elders that were in the first set of pictures have now passed. And so to know that this project took place and that these voices were captured to be memorialized for the future is just, you know, it, it's just thrilling to me. Um, these are women that for the most part, they may or may not have been practicing Ohlone ways. Sometimes we're, some people were in the middle of um, an era where you really didn't talk about your background or you didn't know about your background. And the reason was really for mere survival. It wasn't because you were in denial. It wasn't because you were ashamed, but it was because for the purpose of survival, you just didn't talk about who you were. And that's something that was handed down to me for sure um, by my grandmother. And then the other thing that we'll talk about a little bit later more is probably the idea of sacred is secret, which essentially means way back when you didn't share what you did at home, you didn't share um, anything really about your culture because you were concerned that it would be um, miscommunicated or misunderstood. And so you just kept that secret. Secret, And you really did live two lives. You lived your private family life and then you lived your working school life. So that's something that I think about when I look at these pictures. So the next part of our program, we are gonna actually hear for um, for people that were part of the photo show. Um, the first person will be Greg Castro and you already heard a little bit from him. He did our opening prayer and song. Um, I'd like to add that he is deeply involved in um, Indian education and preserving cultural ways and curriculum development. The second person is Terry or Teresa Alderati. Um, so she's also a historian, she's a genealogist She's a master regalia designer and jewelry maker. And in the community, you know, people know her for those important things. Next is Catherine Herrera, who's a professional photographer and a filmmaker and a documentary filmmaker. And she'll talk a little bit about how the project transformed the way she does her work and maybe a little bit about what she sees for the future. And then the last person that we interviewed is Marcus Rodriguez. The thing I love about Marcus is he's he's generally a pretty quiet, shy person. But um, since I've been working with him, um, well, I, I, I left California and then I came back. And as soon as I came back, I, was, I, kept, I started to look around for people that I could mentor and I picked Marcus. <laughs> so now we have Marcus on stage. Now he's a head dancer for lots of good reasons. He's a teacher, a cultural teacher. He's a college student, so he's trying to get that done. And in addition to that, he's an army veteran and he still works, um, he's in the reserves in the army also, you know, when he has spare time. So we'll meet you guys back again right after these videos. So uh, Ruth Morgan is a premier photographer. And if you haven't seen her work, you need to look up her website and see some of the work that she's done. It's just incredible. And then Janet Klinger um, is a journalist and a documentary historian. Historian. Um, and she interviewed many Ohlone people, but has uh, just interviewed lots of people all around the country. Um, and will trace their journey and the project a little bit and um, just be inspired by the work that they've done and the visibility that they brought for the Ohlone people. Ruth, would you like to go ahead and say something? Sure. Um, I'm a photographer, but I'm also the founder and executive director of a nonprofit organization called Community Works that uh, is dedicated to transforming justice 
um, through policy and practice that's rooted in healing and in restorative justice. And I, I wanted to sort of bring up one program just because I think it's really relevant to the discussion today, and that's our restorative community conference program where we bring together people who have committed uh, high misdemeanors and felonies um, with the person they harmed um, in conference. And the person who harmed talks about um, their accountability for the, for the harm. And the person who was harmed talks about the impact on themselves, their family, and the community. And the reason I bring it up is because we are incredibly indebted to indigenous peoples for this process. And um, um, their communities were really built on the understanding and of the interconnectedness, interconnectedness and responsibility of the individual to the community. Um, and there's no incarceration in indigenous communities. And so I, I remember very um, clearly uh, Greg talking about this, how Ohlone peoples have um, their own structures and processes to deal with conflict and harm. So I think, I think it's re relevant to sort of um, have, for me to be really um, express my gratitude for um, the whole restorative justice movement that really is based on uh, indigenous culture. My research of you, Ruth, uh, and Janet, your works, uh, one of the things that was mentioned, uh, you know, again and again was that your pictures, the pictures that you take are life-size when they're shared with the public, right? Mm -hmm. And having that life-size portrait to interact with um, in such a sensitively taken, you know, portrait, I think that kind of brings home to the people watching and experiencing it that these are actual people you're talking about. Ruth, any, anything you want to say about that? I, was, I think I was very influenced by um, a sociologist and a photographer named Lewis Hines who um, photographed in the 20s and 30s. Um, um, subjects always retained their dignity in these photographs, even though they were in the most horrific um, situ you know, situations. And so I tried to find a way in which to um, do photography in that kind of, in that, in that spirit. Um, and the life-size portraits at, at San Quentin were really, um, were effective in, I people say, in, in really humanizing these people who um, there but for fortune we could be um, in the same situation, but you know, are in prison for, for often just for one mistake that they made. Um, so that's been effective for me um, in, in my work. And um, it's kind of what I've wanted to portray in, in most of the work that I do, is to really kind of show something about the person. Um, yeah. Janet, would you like to tell us something about your work? Maybe a short introduction, a little background, and then something about your work? I would love to. Um, I'm an historian. I've been doing history all of my life. Um, I think where I really connected with Indigenous people was through my grandmother, who in the late 1800s, spent summers on a ranch in Colorado, and she saw how Native people were treated. She told us about it. And so I, I've had an interest in, in Native history all of my life. And currently I'm working on a project, um, actually it's almost done, um, where my nephew and I, and I drug Ruth into this, we, tr we camped around the Ohio Valley every summer looking at areas where one of the Delaware civil chiefs lived in the 1700s and following his history. And at the same time, following my family history and trying to connect those two things together. And because in, in the work that I've been doing over the years, I see the importance of place, not only to Native people, but to the invaders. They need to know their local history. They need to understand it, and they need to know who they've 
displaced. And so my work has centered around that. Early on in my educational career, I did a series of interviews with the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters to look at their, they were sort of the beginning of the civil rights movement. And that was a fascinating look at, at the work that, you know, that they were doing. And then Ruth and I connected, I was working for the YWCA, Ruth and I connected um, by creating, uh, I was running a mentorship program for girls who were coming through the juvenile justice system. And so Ruth and I created this program for them where we taught them how to take uh, photos and I taught them to interview women in their community. And that's how we met Anne Marie was through that project because she was one of the women we interviewed. And of course, you know how captivating she is. <laughs> so she drug us in the direction of, of doing a series of interviews with Ohlone Women Elders, which you helped to put together, you and um, Canyon and Terry. Mm -hmm. So that was, our, that was our progress into doing work around indigenous people. Um, Janet, what you said about plays and how everybody, the new, you know, you, you said the invaders and the, uh, the native people, you know, both have to understand place where we, the work that we do, we are seeing immigration happen at such a rapid pace in the Silicon Valley and the greater Bay area that we feel like, you know, in the pursuit of opportunity, the significance of place is being lost, right? People, who have lived here for decades are losing their connectedness and the newcomers who come in are you know looking for that connectedness so i'm just fascinated by what you said um charlene now it's your show <laughs> <laughs> so now i want to hear a little bit more about the project itself and how did it get started what was the discussion with um Anne marie like um after we interviewed Anne marie for that project uh, that we that I was doing with the YWCA, she uh, convinced us to do um, a similar project with Ohlone women elders that that she who she was going to honor at Indian Canyon, and we loved the idea. So we put together a booklet. We interviewed for maybe eight or nine. We interviewed them and photo and Ruth photographed them, and most of these most of the elders, um, because of cultural suppression, ha did not know a great deal about the culture, and they were thrilled that they were going to be honored and learn more and uh, participate in a ceremony to honor them. So, after we did that. Anne Marie again with her magical self said, Well, maybe we should really look at the whole Ohlone um, culture. We started to go to Indian Canyon and participate in ceremony. It was important to give the Ohlone, help them get a, a public voice. And so we created an exhibit and a book. And the exhibit opened at the San Francisco Public Library in 2014. And it was an enormous success. We had a wonderful turnout. What I would add is that um, I think what hooked me was really going to Indian Canyon and to kind of see the hundreds and hundreds of volunteers that were that Anne Marie um, roped in and excited, got excited about really helping her uh, dream to, to create Indian Canyon into a retreat and a refuge dedicated to the revitalization of native culture and created a shared uh, community space um, for spiritual practice. And that just, I feel like to be witness to it and to have a tiny little piece of it. I mean, we didn't do that much, but we did witness it. 
um, was remarkable and, you know, unforgettable, really. Um, and so I think that's, um, that's what hooked us. And also, we never, ever felt like an outsider. We always were just, you know, invited in in a way that um, really felt exceptional um, and, it, and is certainly um, uh, indicative of Native um, culture and, and Native values, I think. Um, um, I, I think we both probably felt honored to be able to, to, to give back in some way, um, you know, understanding the genocide that uh, uh, preceded, uh, you know, that, that is our history. The idea of being able to to give back in, a, in some way and share um, share this this um, what the work that the Ohlone were doing to the general public and to um, give it as a record for the Ohlone who um, participated in the project for gen for generations to follow but also to educate the uh, general public about the incredible culture and vibrant history of uh, Native people, and, and particularly that the Ohlone are still here and that they are still practicing um, their culture. Um, and as, as she said, despite the fact that um, of the hammer of cultural suppression, the culture survived. And, and the elders held on to the information and it, it's just blossomed in the last what, 20 years? It's been incredible. Um, the other thing was the reverence that we saw for the, the natural world and the connection to all, all creatures, including rocks. The ancestors are embedded in the rocks. Mm -hmm. That was a powerful message to me that because I'm 900 years old. It's their, their total honoring of the elders, the honoring of the ancestors, the connection they make with the ancestors. So there's, 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 no, there's no end. It's like a, 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 an incredible circle that surrounds you. And it's helped me personally to connect with my ancestors. Mm. I really appreciate and I, and I would I would just add to that that the timing is just right. So that's part of the, the whole thing is whether we're talking about being able to record here on Zoom right now or whether we're talking about the project in what we think was probably 2003 or 2004. <laughs> um, the timing is just right because growing up, what, what I was told is um, sacred is secret. Like that's, that was the common theme, sacred is secret. And you didn't talk to anybody about or share um, ceremonial ways or language or songs or anything. You definitely didn't record it. Like that was definitely taboo. You, if you wanted to learn, you know, what they told you was you need to be present and be fully present. And fully present means not only just there, but there with your heart, your mind, your spirit, and also without the abuse of any kind of substance. Like your mind needed to be very clear because they wanted to teach you and they wanted you to remember the things they were about to teach you. You know, and now we're in another generation and, you know, space, land space is crucial and trying to find places to do ceremony is just getting harder and harder. So again, it's important to record all of this. Um, I wanted to add one more thing about the surprises uh, um, for me, which was that the language restoration, I mean, I am just, it's so important because it so much um, tells you about the culture, but I am amazed that there are like 25, I think at least 25 um, speakers today when there were uh, only a few a decade ago. And to me, that's like, really the, the groundwork for um, revitalization of a culture. Well, I'd, I'd just like to add one of the other things that we're hoping to do with the project. As, as we said earlier, we did a similar project with the Shawnee, the Piqua Shawnee in the Ohio Valley. And what we'd like to do is bring the two projects together neither one of them are federally recognized at this point. And as I said, nobody is living on a reservation. So they're having to live in the larger society 
while trying to maintain their culture. So the, the, the conflicts around that are really strong. So I think that's an important extension of this project. No. No, I was, I was just going to add, Mosaic Silicon Valley's mission is to bring cultures together. And I have taken note of what you said. Um, I wanted to kind of talk about a little bit about what you touched upon, actually, that growing up, sharing your culture was taboo and you had to kind of, you know, sacred is secret. I, I just wanted to kind of take that out and kind of explode it into what's happening um, in America today, right? Everybody, every group, is kind of trying to find their identity, right? Um, or is feeling under threat. And there's this whole, you know, who is American? What is American art? What is an American culture? What does it take to be American, right? Everybody kind of feels a little bit like they're in this defining moment, uh, you know, where they need to define for themselves and then everybody else around them needs to recognize that they are American. And the question of, are you American enough? or are you American at all, should never be coming up. Do you, do you guys have any thoughts, all three of you? Wow. Wow. Well, one of the questions we asked in the interview was, who is Native American? <laughs> what, what, what people told us was the DNA is immaterial. What is important is people living the culture. And that to me is, is really important. Um, in the bigger picture, who, who is American, that is, that, is, that is a whole study in itself. Really? Supposedly, we have always welcomed other people into this culture. And because we haven't dealt with two enormous problems that have been in this country forever, which was slavery and the genocide against Native people, we, we haven't fulfilled our mission. And when we can deal with those two things, then, you know, uh, the Statue of Liberty becomes an alive thing. And we do welcome anyone who needs refuge. That's what we've, that's what we have aspired to. We just haven't, we haven't been able to fulfill that. And that's our dream for the future is that we can really recognize the past for all of the, the negative things that happened and some of the positive things, but really be honest about the genocide against Native people and the issue of slavery. Those two things have to be dealt with first, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Those, those two big things have to be, you know, really resolved. Um, uh, yeah, and I, it was fascinating to, to hear different people's view of what it is to be Native. I mean, you know, some did say, you know, blood quantum, but most didn't. They really did say how you, it's how you live your life. Um, and uh, it's an interesting question, what's American, especially today. You're absolutely right. It's a fascinating question. Um, it's, you know, it's the challenge, really. It's, it's a huge challenge, um, but there's some way that that has to happen where we're, you know, one, one culture is not pitted against another. Uh, right. So I'm, I'm kind of hopeful, but you know, I think that's part of the, the essence of this project that you know, we are all, all human and we all want the same things. Um, and I'm, I, I'm just, I'm really hopeful because I think this younger generation is gonna really change the world. Um, so. I guess I'll, I'll give my, probably a very short answer is, I, I think about, <clears throat> So I came back to California to work back in high tech again and for legal departments. And some of the companies that I've worked for are, it's really, it's really fun. There really is, it's really a new era. Like it's not about what people looks, look like, it's about what do you have to share. 
And, and to me, it reminds me of indigenous cultures. Like what, what, what do you have to share? And we all have different things to share. And together we make incredible things, whatever the thing is, right? Whether you're talking about, um, you know, a, a software tool, <laughs> an online software tool like Zoom, <laughs> or you're talking about a widget or you're, you're figuring out how to, or you're growing food so that you can um, sell it at uh, Trader Joe's or, you know, whatever it is, but we, you know, if we as Americans could say, all right, this is, this is the skill that I have to offer. These are the skills I see in my children. And we just enhance each other's skills, support each other to be the best that we can at whatever we're doing. Um, what would it be like? Yeah. We are at Mosaic Silicon Valley, right? We are always trying to kind of see how do we get the whole person right into every environment do you do you check out some of your you know um some of yourself when you enter into a room right and that should not be the case right you have to show up in all of your glorious diversity and be included because of it and and that's how belonging and connectedness to place and people start anyway i you know this has been a fantastic conversation all right, um, like we indicated before, we are gonna move right along on to our four uh, Ohlone community member participants and uh, Ruth and Janet, uh, this is gonna be such a special moment for you, I'm sure, because you haven't heard from these people in a long time. And uh, some of the things that they have to say about your work warmed my heart. So I'm sure it's gonna, you know, it's gonna uh, take you to a good place. <laughs> All right, here goes. Bear with me, everybody, while I start that video. Um, I'm Greg Castro. I'm Klaus Linen, Rumson, and Ramatushaloni. Uh, my uh, mom and dad got married and came to San Jose in 1950. And that's where my two older brothers and I were born and raised here in San Jose, where I'm still at. And uh, growing up here was uh, very quiet because I knew very few other Native people. Uh, most of my relatives did not live in the area. They lived down in Monterey County area. And uh, so being here, I was surrounded by uh, Hispanic uh, Chicano uh, families um, and with the last name of Castro. Um, they assumed that was my identity. And of course, I do have that heritage as well. But uh, it was... Uh, uh, something that we kept quiet. Um, I learned that from my dad and my mom went along with that. Um, that's the way they grew up. Uh, just like uh, he said, his parents, his grandparents who raised him said, um, be proud of who you are, but uh, don't tell anybody. And that's a, a vestige of, uh, I think the dark times uh, when it was dangerous to be a native. So uh, I continue that. And actually most of the people I grew up with from kindergarten to graduating from high school, actually didn't know I was Native, but just a few of them. Um, but I did explore that issue um, when I was in high school. I went to the Native American Center downtown San Jose and tried to get a scholarship. And they essentially told me there were no more California Indians. They were all dead. And so I left and didn't go back for almost 20 years. <laughs> um, and that's been sort of the experience that I think uh, not only myself, but I think a lot of Ohlone people had of, of growing up, of being not acknowledged as existing, that uh, Ohlone people were in the past. They put them in a book somewhere and talk about them from a long distance and then get on with our lives and, and do whatever it is we're doing here in modern society. So when uh, Janet and Ruth came up with the project, uh, I know my mom was very excited. Um, she unfortunately passed away during the middle of the project, and so her picture didn't get into the book. Um, but the book was dedicated. Uh, she was one of the two people that the book was dedicated to. And her two sisters, uh, younger sisters, are in the book, aunt, my Aunt Lou and Aunt Chick, um, Lou Alvarado Diaz and Marie Alvarado Ryans, uh, are both in the book uh, and pictured in there. And uh, all three of them went to the ceremony where they were honored in Indian Canyon. And I remember my mom was uh, just deeply, deeply moved. Uh, going to the canyon and being the focus of that, um, having been interviewed 
having uh, been honored and respected in that way. Um, I think all of the elders that were honored in that first round of pictures, but it's, I know especially my mom and her two sisters, my two aunties, were uh, ecstatic, deeply moved uh, to tears and, and felt very honored and acknowledged um, in a way they had never felt before because that was a part of their heritage that they rarely got to express in any way. Our family didn't associate with any of the particular tribal uh, organizations. They stayed as a, a autonomous family group uh, in a pretty large one um, in the Salinas area and very proud of their heritage. And uh, so when uh, I got photographed and some of the other uh, relations got photographed, I think they uh, it was an extra prideful moment for them. Um, it didn't just end with them. And those, their pictures, they knew it was going to continue and uh, supported my work to a lot of us. It certainly is to me. Um, I don't want to miss anything where there's an opportunity where I might um, share with one person who didn't know before that the uh, Lonely people are still here. They're not, ex they're not dead. They're not extinct. Um, they're still here. They're still vibrant. And uh, they're recapturing and re reawakening their culture that's been asleep for a while. Um, that was asleep in order to protect itself and to protect the people. And now we have finally realized and awakened to the idea that we don't have to do that anymore. And uh, we need to stand up and now protect the uh, land that gave birth to us. What do you see as the value of these photo documentary projects for communities like ours? Um, <sighs> Reading and hearing is important, but especially in modern society, I think we're so focused on the visual. And I think what's important about what Ruth and Janet did, that visual component, seeing these elders, seeing them for in, re, in a real context. These are the, not in Edward Curtis type photos from the past, but real life modern contemporary uh, pictures of how they are now. It's not an, it, it, when you see the pictures, it no longer can be an abstraction. Maloney people can't be an abstraction when there's these pictures of elders, culture bearers, wonderful uh, ancestral people that have carried this heritage so that we can bring it forward. Um, and so you can't, there, there can't be a denial of that any longer. They have to, it, there's a realness to them that you can't get from an audio recording, a quote on a piece of paper. Um, it, it's not, the, it, it, those are all very important and need to be done. But the visual part, I think, is what's extraordinary about this project. Um, that makes it real in the eyes of other people. My name's Teresa Alderetti. Um, I, w I live in, currently live in Seaside right now, but I've lived in the Bay Area most of my, all my life. Uh, raised my son, my daughter in San Jose. Um, between San Jose and Gilroy, um, they, they grew up there. Okay, so I, what I remember of the photo project was uh, Janet and Ruth coming to ask me if I'd be part of this project. And, you know, at I was really nervous about it, scared. I'm kind of shy. I don't, people don't believe I'm shy, but I am. <laughs> but I was really honored when they asked to, to interview me um, and do some photos. And um, yeah, I just, um, I was really, really nervous about it. But after, after it all came together, I was pretty happy with the photos. Uh, going back and reading what I, what I uh, said in the interview what was it's, over 15 years ago, I think. So I was pretty uh, excited about it. And then when it came around the second time, but my son was in in that one. Um, it's pretty exciting to to be in to be in a book. Um, and hopefully, you know, in the future, my children or my grandchildren will go back and read that. I I think it's really important to document everything because during my research, I'm searching for stuff like that, for books and interviews and pictures. And 
uh, looking way back, there's not a whole lot. There are, there are some, but not, not a whole lot. So it really inspired me to continue doing that, to um, interview my elders and record their stories, collect all the pictures. And uh, recently we've um, uh, interviewed quite a few people and they were willing to give us all their information, let us uh, make copies of their documents and their stories, their family, and put together their family charts. It's really led me uh, to continue that. Um, throughout all these years, I've been doing that. And my phone is, nothing's organized, but it's there. So if somebody- And what do you think about the future of this project? What would you like to see? Uh, I'd like to see it continue with the new one, the new uh, generation coming up um, that are learning and uh, coming out and, you know, finding out who they are and uh, learning to dance and sing and some are learning language. And I think it's really important to continue, really, really important. Um, I have a grandson, he's seven, and hopefully one day he'll be interviewed and tell his stories of growing up. Uh, my name is Catherine, and um, I live in San Francisco. Um, I'm a professional photographer and filmmaker and artist um, who uh, really had the great opportunity to um, find my way to Indian Canyon and from there uh, to meet all the wonderful people that were a part of this project. Um, they asked me to sit for them uh, for, uh, you know, the portrait session and to do some interviews. And it was a beautiful process um, because uh, we did the interviews over various sessions and they would send the interview. So I had the opportunity to look at what I had said and to consider it. And I was going through such a, a personal process of uh, recovering my family history. And so those interviews and being a part of it uh, was very meaningful to me for that, as well as being part of the community and um, to see the photos of the elders, see the elders memorialized, um, to know that their stories were going to travel, um, was very moving. I was glad to be a part of it. I remember that a friend of mine wrote me and said, oh my God, I just went into the San Francisco Public Library and there you were in a big photo. <laughs> and I said, what, what? I called Ruth, what are you doing? Oh my God, oh. I think we did that big gathering there. Remember when, yep. yeah. So that was very special too, because uh, Anne-Marie and Tony and um, several other elders spoke. And so again, it was an opportunity to see our involvement and the other generations. And that was very moving. That was very moving for me. And I think not just for me, but for my son and for my dad. I think, you know, he was still grappling with um, coming to terms with uh, the research that I was doing and what we were finding and trying to understand that in the context of what his father told him. So he loved it and he really loved being a part of that day. Mm -hmm. I think of Anne Marie, uh, you know, when we were all making the necklaces for the, the elder women, you know, um, every shell is a prayer. And so those photographs are prayers. I tried to approach it that way um, when I sat down to do the work was to see it as a, a prayer. And so I think that those photographs are traveling around and um, like you were saying before, uh, you know, reminding people who uh, the Ohlone are, and not just in the past, but today, and to see the, wow, to see the shell mound in Berkeley be recognized as a national historical site, it's beautiful. 
it's beautiful. All those prayers of those photographs and the interviews and those words traveled. And so I think when I first came back from Mexico, I was still of the mindset that you don't ever take photographs of certain things. And I never pulled my camera out. I had my professional job and I was working on a PBS documentary at the time and that was my work. And this was community and what we did in the community. And when I was first asked to take photographs, it was the first time where, you know, I said, what, what do you, you want me to take photographs, you know, here? And I saw suddenly my work from a different perspective because I was told that these documents of what we're doing will have an impact. And so that was such a beautiful moment for me. It, it really was touching because suddenly my worlds could come together and suddenly all the work I had done could be useful to the community and could have ramifications out, a uh, ripple effect out. So, um, so now a days there is a lot more acceptance of that, you know? I mean, I remember early on taking photos at Alcatraz and an elder coming up and was like, you can't do that. That's not allowed. You know, and I felt so embarrassed and I said, well, I was asked to take the photos by uh, an Ohlone elder. And so, you know, now to think of that when we have videos and photos, you know, so accessible, it really transforms the photo into something more, I think, these days. So I was happy to be a part of that change. And that is when my career changed. That's when I decided that I wanted to make films that were from the community, were important to the community. I had made a film, Witness the Healing, about my own family, but with Bridge Walkers, I, I took on the topic of sacred sites and interviewed Anne-Marie and Karina Gould and El Frank, and it was an opportunity to give back to the community in the way that I had originally hoped, that it wasn't just about me, but contributing. So. I'm so grateful that I was asked to start taking photos and videos and to be a part of this process because um, it changed my life. And Hello, my name is uh, Marcus Rodriguez and I'm from San Jose, born in San Jose and raised in Gilroy. I'm a uh, Shumash Manino and Ohlone. And I'm an army veteran. Uh, I've become a head dancer for our uh, tribe and um, been learning a lot more songs to, to teach. Really my main role is to teach the new generations. I remember Ruth, Ruth and Janet doing this project where my picture was taken and it really meant a lot to me because that means that we were getting documented so the people that don't know that our people are still here, the Ohlone people are still here because a lot of people think that there's not natives here in the Bay Area, so it's a good way to show people that we are still here. So I remember uh, seeing this project being displayed at Coyote Hills in Fremont for Ohlone People's Day. Um, it was in the museum area and in the hallway. Several other pictures were also hung up as well as mine. And what was the audience reaction? The people that came by to see the pictures, what was their reaction to the photos? The audience uh, loved it. Um, they also uh, said the same thing where they, they liked how everything was getting documented. I would like to see more of these projects being more visible. Uh, even more so outside of uh, events that that we have for Ohlone peoples, so they can see see these projects on a, a daily basis in different areas where 
even where indigenous people are not at. Um, has the, this project being part of this project inspired you to do anything new? I know this was a long time ago, but since then, has it inspired you to do anything different? Yes, it's uh, inspired me to uh, keep on teaching um, our uh, new generations so uh, people can still know that we're still here and uh, all of our teachings get passed on. I will send my first question to to Greg. So one of the things that um, people asked, or one of the things that's happening right now is land recognitions. And land recognition really has to do with just acknowledging who the people are, um, the original people are for a particular area of land. And one of the common questions that comes to me is how do I figure that out? And how do I go about it? And I know that you've done some land recognitions and some opening prayers. So maybe you could help answer that question for somebody that might be interested. You know, they want to know who were the original people that lived where I live right now? And how do I figure that out? Uh, that is actually a complicated question. And I know there's a lot of interest amongst people to do that right now. And, and I don't want to denigrate it by calling it a fad, but it is a little bit of a fad. It, it's very fashionable now to do a land acknowledgement. And I certainly don't want to dis discourage that because it can be very important. In fact, right minutes before this uh, webinar started this evening, I was on a we another webinar with the Human Rights Commission at San Francisco, who we proposed uh, a land acknowledgement for the Ramatush people to and they're in the process of accepting it, and uh, which is pretty uh, a dramatic uh, event, actually, uh, because most, uh, you know, lots of organizations do land acknowledgements as a paragraph they say at the beginning of their meetings, and the Human Rights Commission has been doing that. Other organizations up in San Francisco have been doing that, but they actually accept it formally and put it into an ordinance, which will eventually uh, and hopefully proliferate throughout the city of San and county of San Francisco. Um, that's uh, pretty monumental. And um, so that's way more than just a, a fad. Um, but it's also just the beginning uh, of building a relationship. Uh, one of the issues that comes up with land acknowledgement, especially in California, is that um, in lots of places, um, of, of Ohlone country in particular, uh, you have multiple groups in the same place, which isn't the way we used to live. But it's, what, it's a, a survival tactic. It is the result of, of colonization and genocide. And we have to, you know, so it's important in this process that you remember the history of the people. And the brutal history is that more than 90% of our ancestors died in that very short period of time of initial colonization. After being here tens, even 15,000 years, and all of a sudden in a relatively short time, which to us is just 111 years from 1769 when the first Spaniards came in an expedition to the 1880 census, it showed at least a 90% loss of life for native people. So think about that and then think about the 10% or less that survived, what are they gonna do? And we talked about, you know, you heard a little bit about that in the videos. And so they developed techniques, tactics, basically whatever they needed to do in order to survive. And what that has done in their scramble and desperate need to survive is formed all kinds of ways of surviving, mostly in quiet, as you said earlier. And what that has led to now is different groups forming in different ways in the same area. And they all are rightfully heirs of that place in many cases and are real often related to each other, but they're now in different groups. So you're talking about different groups, but the same tribe, essentially. It, that came from the same tribe, right? Uh, you could say. And now are, you know, 
in different organizational structures. Right. And sometimes they are related to each other. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they work with each other. Sometimes they're not. So what's important to remember is right now, we're still in survival mode as an Ohlone people, as California people. We're still surviving. We're still in that thought pattern. And we're still working out those issues after being pushed down so low. You know, like I said, like I said in the video, my dad grew up with grandparents raising him that remembered a time when it was dangerous to be an Indian, where you could be killed for being an Indian. That's only two generations, you know, a couple of generations away and two lifetimes away. So we're still in that mode. And so what you see now is various organizations, groups, trying to figure out how to survive in this world and still maintain their culture and now step forward and, and take that responsibility that we all feel for the land that gave us birth. So now going back to land acknowledgement, we, I look at it as just the beginning. You know, it's not just something that we want to just, you know, get up in front of a microphone and, you know, uh, say a few words and then that's it, you're done. It's for these organizations and especially for governments that are affecting our land, we want to build a relationship. And that's only a very small part, an important part, but a small part of the relationship that will allow us to come back to our land to take care of it the way it needs to be taken care of and to heal it. And by healing it, we're gonna heal ourselves. And so the land acknowledgement process is, is, can be pretty complicated, but right now it's just working out as, you know, hey, who's gonna do a, a prayer at the beginning of our meeting. And, um, and we're working with that and going with that, but we want it to be so much more. And of course, you know, the people that wanna do that are, there's very few of us. And so we're getting literally hundreds of requests, you know, every month for that kind of thing. So it's also a strain for us, but it's so important that we try to meet um, the requests as best as we can. And expanding on that, um, and this is a this is a question for all of you on the panel. Uh, this question is from Chris Lorenz Lorenk. He's my he says, my view is that this nation has been founded on three original sins: land theft, genocide, and enslavement, and white imposed economic inequality. My question is, what thoughts do you have? And what sources can you share about how we can take concrete steps forward towards an integrated reparation plan that would address these three foundational injustices and violence land, of land theft, genocide, and enslavement? Ruth, Janet, do you want to take maybe a first stab at the answer? Oh, um, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> First is uh, really the acknowledgement that uh, this all happened because I think you know I think I think people think they you know they acknowledge it but the, but it really has not been acknowledged. Um, I think reparations, frankly, I think are um, for slavery and for the uh, genocide of Native Americans is is really important too. I mean, I, it's complicated, um, but I think more people are talking about it. Um, these days, and I think that that may be you know another way. Um, but I think acknowledgement, real real acknowledgement, is the first step, um, and then you know some sort of rep reparations. Yeah, the the true history needs to be told mm -hmm. in the schools, starting in at least the middle school, about what the real California history which is horrendous what happened to Native people. I think the land issue is so important. Uh, you know, Native people need to have a place where they, they feel comfortable doing ceremony and coming together. Indian Canyon, that, thanks to Anne Marie, there is that space, but there should be spaces all over California. This is all stolen land. And, and the, the, to acknowledge that is the first step. 
We have to, we have to come to grips with that. I mean, the other thing that I, that I meant to also say is the sacred sites to really, really right. acknowledge sacred sites because that is so important to um, Maloney. But I also think that it's it's also an acknowledgement that um, is really an incredible way to acknowledge what happened. Um, so, and I, I, there's a little bit of that happening now, certainly um, maybe in Berkeley, but um, some of that's happening. But I think that's really, really important. And there's sacred sites all over. All over the country. Yeah, all over the country, right. Um, Charlene, Catherine, Terry, Greg, Marcus. I'll say something. I don't. I don't have the answer <laughs> to that question. It's. Um, I would agree that. I would say that you know, starting with the land, it starts with the land. Um, but I will say that. So I, I did. I taught ethnic studies, um, at a university, at a couple different universities, and one of the areas that we touched upon was Native American studies, and when people that were not Native. Um, which were most of my students, got into that section, we would have counseling sessions after every class because they didn't know what to do. They thought that their parents, their not their parents, but their grandparents, great grandparents um, were given land. <laughs> and when I didn't tell them anything, I didn't have to tell them anything. It was all in the materials and the research that they'd done themselves to find out that nobody gave them land. The land was not vacant people had to be pushed off the land or you know and and not willingly <laughs> and 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 sometimes getting pushed off the land meant getting pushed off the cliff right um so so i think education is a start um being honest about education and and letting people you know, young people explore and find for themselves what has happened. You can lead the way, but but have them give them a good understanding for you know whatever state you live in. It could be California, but it could be Minnesota. It could be South Dakota, North Dakota, wherever you want. Florida. Pick your pick your location, and have young people discover for themselves what the history of their land is. And then the next step that I tell my students, at least is you know you're not responsible for for your ancestors but what you can do is you can at least teach your children another way you can guide them in another direction That's right. and you can have them learn for themselves and you can teach them where they live and what happened in the past and how to be more open-minded if all of that is said one of the things that could happen is just super quickly is i was um, invited to to a gent to see some land, a private piece of land. Um, this gentleman he owns um, hundreds of acres probably, and um, we got to see a place that is actually an Ohlone village, practically intact except for the buildings. And it partly is because it's private land. And so we discussed how could we turn this particular area into a, a land trust? How could we protect it with the law so that even when it's sold in the future, it can't be um, built upon? Um, that conversation has a long way to go still, but because he was aware of his surroundings, because he knew the people who lived there before, because he understood the special location that he was witnessing and that these weren't regular rock formations and this wasn't a regular flat area, um, he was able to figure out for himself what was on the land that he was entrusted with. But that's just the beginning. There's so much more work to be done. Anybody else? I pick Catherine. <laughs> I know you have something to say. Uh, well, I, I think that it's important to uh, maybe even find a new term for this uh, process because it, it, it's, um, it's a necessary process for both parts of the culture to heal. I think there's some idea that, um, you know, I was hearing an elder speak recently and he was describing an event where someone said, well, what can we do to heal you? And I, 
he was struck and, and it struck me as well that it, it, it's actually a mutual healing process that needs to occur. There was damage on both sides in that respect. Uh, if you look at it on a spiritual level. So I, I appreciate everything that's been said so far. And I, I, I think that that might be a, an important element to consider. Um, in some of the work that I'm doing now in the research, you know, I'm going back into Europe a thousand years. I knew, uh, like I found something in the 1700s where Irish people were leaving the country because the rents went up three times. You know, and, I, and that struck me. It was like, oh, this is a practice that was brought here that is impacting people today. So I think in that way, it's, it's important to think of reparations uh, it, as, a, a, as an important mutual healing process um, to occur. And then I guess in California, there's the, the mission system and the law that it was, the way it was written was that the land was to be returned to native people. So I think today there's a great opportunity for a partnership uh, in, in the, in, on that land um, to fulfill that, that legal mandate. Hey, Marcus, Greg? This is just such an important, I just want to make sure that you are heard. I'll say something. Uh, I think uh, when we were talking about um, for um, land theft, I think uh, one of the things that we can probably address is probably returning land back to the lonely people. Like we, we really don't have anywhere to really call home to do our ceremonies at. Um, and for people to connect with that as people where we go home to feel safe. We go home to have family traditions and do different things, build memories. And I think that we need a place where we can call home. And by doing that is getting land back to our people. So we as Ohlone people can come together and do these ceremonies and have memories and traditions and bring back the old ways that our ancestors have uh, practiced and have lived. Thank you. Greg, Terry? Yeah, I answered uh, Chris's question on the chat uh, and I know Chris and I know um, where he's kind of coming from. He's a, he's a good ally and friend to uh, California native people, always supportive. And it's a good question. Um, my answer to him was, you know, I, I have my own maybe radical ideas about uh, restitution. Um, but I think before we even get there, I think Catherine said what we really need to do first and that's what we need to heal. Um, I think that's a traditional way. Um, you can't really build anything on a, on a mushy foundation. Um, you can't build even a tule hut on ground that's moving and, it's, and, and muddy and, and sliding around. And we're still there. In fact, you know, we just went through uh, the last couple of weeks and are still going through uh, basically a, a landslide of, of American uh, history that they don't even know that, that that's why it's happening. They're, they're so oblivious to that. And until they understand and face what happened here, any solution we come up with is just going to be a facade to me. So you have to start at the core. And, and certainly if somebody wants to give me a plot of land, I'll take it um, because I can certainly use it. And we're working on those issues now because that does seem to be for some people easier, e even inexpensive San Francisco Bay Area, it's easier to just give us some land than deal with the real issue, which is inside them and with inside each of us. So that's a gesture they can do. And then they go, wow, that feels good. Now I can go do something else and not do the real work. And our ancestors, especially our, our medicine people and our healers taught us, you know, you got to dig deep. You know, you, when, when there's a pus sack, you got to open it up and let it drain. And it's going to hurt and it's going to smell 
and it's going to look ugly and it's absolutely necessary before you can really heal and put a bandage around that wound and then be able to do something. Um, and, and we haven't even got close to that, to, in my opinion. Terry? Do you want to add anything? I'm listening. I'm, I'm taking it all in. <laughs> Sure. So we have a question from uh, uh, the San Jose Museum of Art YouTube channel. Robin, are you on? Yes, I am here. Thank you, Priya. Sure. Uh, this is a question from Laura. And I think um, this has probably been addressed, but I just wanted to make sure that her question gets, gets put out there. Um, I think what she was referencing was the uh, discussion about keeping the sacred secret. And so her question is, was it secret because of the suppression? And then she says, I imagine it was dangerous to express the culture. So that's her question. Charlene, you had said it. <laughs> <laughs> it actually goes, it really goes back generations. So there was, you know, so every, so people on the panel here know that, um, there was actually a bounty for the head of a native person. And we've seen the posters, we've seen the literature, we, you know, even if it was just word of mouth and kind of um, folklore that you thought you heard from your family, there's the evidence that says this was actually a fact. And so when people said sacred is secret, it was really living two lives. When you were at home, you spoke whatever your language was. In our case, you know, we didn't have the Ohlone language, but it might have been Spanish. Um, but when you went to school, then you spoke English. And not only did you speak English, you spoke it as properly as you possibly could. And you stood up straight. And you made sure that, you know, your clothes were immaculate. Like that you had, you definitely, you just lived in two different worlds because they were so afraid of that history that they had heard of. And they so much wanted to assimilate and just be accepted. And in the beginning, generations, probably just two generations before me, it was really a matter of safety. Um, you know, my grandmother talked about just, just, just pretending to be Mexican, right? Because it was safer for her to be Mexican than for her, for anybody in the family to say that they might be just a little bit native. And, and so that was, that's kind of the sacred is secret. Um, and then later when we started to learn our Ohlone ways and, and more and more tribes started to come out with um, their cultural teachings, there was such a protection around them because they did, wanted to make sure that they weren't destroyed again because that was the history. It was a, a, a history of mission, the mission schools, the mission system, the government entities that essentially outlawed um, speaking of the language or punished you in schools for speaking your language or practicing, even trying to practice any of your culture. And so that's where the sacred is secret kind of comes from. Um, the next question is kind of dear to my heart, our heart at Mosaic Silicon Valley. Francesca Muriera asks, could anyone speak to the artistry of the Ohlone or children's games to share with students? I ask because I want my university students to build awareness for the future elementary school students through arts integration. Thank you for this opportunity to learn. So Charlene, you and I had discussed that some of this we will include in our upcoming episodes, but uh, what do you have to say about the artistry? I'm gonna give that one to Terry because Terry works with children all the time. Go ahead, Terry. I didn't, can you? My, I was thinking about something with the last question, so I didn't hear the, this question here. Do you want to? Do you want to address the last question first? Yeah, and can repeat well, the question? yeah something uh, something Charlene said, and um, about you know, um, sacred is secret. Mm -hmm. In my mom's generation, it wasn't secret. They they were known as Indians, uh, wild Indians living in the mountains or at the base of Mount Madonna, and so my mom didn't have immaculate clothes or shoes, um, they, they, they were poor, they didn't have food to eat. And um, it was known that they were these, uh, of this family. And, um, and, she, and she has a, she holds it all in. And there's still a lot of pain, a lot, a lot of pain in her. 
um, when I interview her, she, she talks about things that in the interviews, when I sit with her, that I won't ever share, you know, some of the parts I won't share because there's some, a lot of pain there. Um, but I, in my generation, um, we didn't know, like my grandma um, or my mom's never, they never talked to us about it. They just said Mission Indians, but everything was silent. But now that my mom, I'm older, my mom has come out with a lot of stuff, a lot of her, her childhood uh, memories. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, the pain is still there. And like Greg was saying, you, um, it's easy to just give some land. Like uh, somebody offered us some land up in Santa Cruz uh, some years ago, uh, the Redwood Forest. and um, but there was so many um, uh, uh, things attached to that land that there was no way we could ha we could take it and take on that big responsibility, you know. So um, even if people did give you land, can you can you take care of that land? Can you afford all the taxes and all that red tape that comes with it, you know? So, anyways, I, that was just I was just thinking that as I was listening to everybody. But <laughs> as the next question, I didn't even hear it. <laughs> I was they wanted to myself. know the artistry um, of the Ohlone. Do I know the artistry? No, talk to talk about oh. it. Oh god! And how do you yeah. practice it? What is it? Give us examples. And, um, and the, <laughs> the second part, Terry, is is in working with children. So if you're trying to teach it to children, like what can you provide as like an example or some guidance? Uh, when I'm talking to kids, um, you know, I get more out of it than the kids do. I think. I do just to see them excited and to dance and they want to learn and they uh, it's uh, a lot of times it's more for me, <laughs> but um, I always tell the kids that, you know, you're, you have to, I'm teaching you something. I'm only teaching you what I know. Your hands work different from my hands. So you teach me your, your ideas, how you do this. Cause I don't even know everything I'm learning. I'm just barely learning how to make um, black dye out of, out of the black walnuts. You know, and so everything for me is experiment. So I, I try to include the kids and have, ask them to help me, help me do this. How do you know, how would you do it? And because, you know, everything I do is just by trial and error, everything. And I, I love to share it. And and um, I'm always willing to share because they have their own ideas, too. They get creative. Like when I'm making necklaces, too, I'm not really into a lot of colors, more earth tone and kids want to be creative and use other colors and they turn out beautiful. And I, I just get so amazed by how, you know, they get so creative and here I, I'm stuck on these four colors, you know, um, but I love it. I, I love sharing right now. I, I have a new, uh, a young lady who wants to learn everything. She says, I want to learn everything. I don't want to just put on a regalia. I want to learn how to make every, every bit of it. And I said, well, right now I'm working with dog bane and you can learn how to make some netting, <laughs> some <laughs> string. And um, it, it never ends. I don't, I hardly ever have time to really sit and do genealogy anymore, <laughs> mm -hmm. but, uh, but I do. In fact, I'm here right now at my cousin Andrea's. She's giving me every paper document because she's moving, but um, yeah. And I want to go through every piece of paper, even though it's all digitized, it's all scanned on my computer but I like hard copies, you know? And so anyways, but right now it's winter time. And so I'm getting back into making some jewelry. And uh, I have a, a, a few little students, like two little, three little boys and a little girl. Mm -hmm. And they all live in Seaside. That's where I live now. And so they're right there, they're close. So I can, I can um, work with them. That's, that's what I do. I'm not a talker or a speaker, or I, you know, and <laughs> I just make things. <laughs> No, and, and, and absolutely, like the next episode, I'm so excited about it because we've structured it to be like a lectem uh, and we're going to follow you by through video <laughs> on how you create your artistry, like Francesca put it. Um, we've been asked to mention something and then I'll move on to one other question. Um, and I know it's late, but I think that these are important questions. So Mimi asks us to kindly mention the sacred Juristak land of the Ama Mutsun in South Santa Clara County, which is proposed to be a gravel mine that could possibly be a typo uh, or an autocorrect. Uh, we are waiting for a draft environmental impact report coming out end of winter. And then she has a link which says protect Juristak 
alloneword.org slash petition. Uh, she asked us to mention it, so I mentioned it. One question from Melissa Howard is, are there Ohlone owned businesses in the Bay Area we can support as community members? Does anybody know of any businesses or maybe even organizations? Yeah, I was, gonna, I was gonna say there is an organization, in fact, you know, because not everybody is set up to accept donations um, so actually, we've been throwing them to somebody else, <laughs> and that's uh, our, our our sister over there in the East Bay, Karina Gould. I've been sending a lot of people her way. Uh, she's protecting the West Berkeley Shell Mound through her organization, Sagora Te Land Trust, and they are 5013C. So you they accept uh, donations, tax deductible. Um, they're they're re doing both protection of the Shell Mound that's right off of. Uh, Highway 80 uh, in Berkeley on University Avenue, uh, which is incurring a lot of legal costs. Uh, some of you may have heard of it. She was on Nightline, uh, the national program, just a few weeks ago. Uh, she made the uh, the Shell Mound made the 11 most endangered sites in America, um, and uh, so hopefully that will give it some attention it richly deserves. Um, and it's still being threatened with development. That's the problem in that particular case. Uh, they were also given some land in Oakland. Um, it's a small plot of land, but it's, it's land and there isn't a lot in such an urbanized place. So it's pretty magnificent. And they've done some restoration work. They've started a community garden there. So Sigori Land Trust is doing both, protecting sites and restoring sites. So. Uh, if people are interested, uh, you know, that's a, a good place to start, especially if you're in the East Bay, but anywhere in the Bay Area. Um, uh, the Amamutsun also have a 5013C and uh, in their their work, they're doing some land restoration and also doing site protection. And that's one of the places they got mentioned there, your stack, uh, down by Gilroy. And uh, it is being threatened by be turned into a rock quarry. Uh, and it is a very important ceremonial site uh, for the Mutsun people that drew lots of other Loni and other people from the area, uh, you know, hundreds and thousands of years ago. Um, so that's an important effort and uh, they could also use financial support, uh, particularly as it goes into probably what's going to wind up in the, into a court battle. Anybody else want to take that on? Ohlone owned businesses? Catherine, are there any in San Francisco? You are uh, an Ohlone owned business. Thank you very much. I was just putting in the uh, chat the Uristak. I think that's the right uh, website for it. Um, in San Francisco, someone was just mentioning on the East Bay at least, uh, the Ohlone Cafe in Berkeley, uh, mm -hmm. run by Vince Medina and his partner, Luis. And that's, uh, as far as I know, been doing very well. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing in the chat, people are also mentioning the Costanoan Indian Research, Indian Canyon is a 501c3, and uh, that would support the work of Anne Marie, who started the project. Uh, but that is, of course, in, uh, in Gilroy. Um, let me see, San Francisco, I guess you could go to my site, uh, CatherineHerreraPhotography.com. And um, uh, anybody else uh, think uh, can think of somebody in San Francisco? Jump in and let me know. I'm trying to. Uh... Canyon has written Costa Noan Indian Research. Yeah, that's Anne, that's Anne Marie's organization, and of course um, we should have mentioned her first because she, you, you know, the the generator of this project that has brought us all here. Sorry, Anne. <laughs> Indian Canyon is also 5013C. Yes. Okay. It's actually the oldest. It's probably the first and oldest, I believe, of all the Ohlone um, nonprofits. So the I have three questions for Ruth and Morgan, uh, Ruth and Janet. First one from Julie is, how can we buy the book? It's um it's on my website, and it's basically for the cost of um, it's it's um, spiral bound, and it's really the cost of what it what it costs to um, create it uh, at Kinko's or wherever. So you can contact me on, at my website and get it. You could also download it and you could read it on online as well. And it's rootsmorganphotography.com. Right, yeah. 
The next question is, um, are the POMO and Mibook being included in this project? In your, in it, so, so I guess it's a, is this, I guess the question is, is this an ongoing project and will more tribes be included such as the POMO and the Mibook? That question is from Carmen Saldivar. Well, we did a second project in um, Ohio, in Northeast Ohio with the Shawnee project. So that's, that's the one we're trying to combine with the Ohlone project. Um, but right now we're not, we haven't started any other uh, Native American, we're doing other projects, but not on anything around Native Americans at this moment. I would say though, that one of the things that I was really excited about, you know, it's kind of a in a way, um, you know, is it's frustrating that so much is going on in the world, and you think about what can we do at home right now while we're we're sitting, and and we're all kind of glued, so many people are glued to their computers, right? And it, even through this project, some of us some of us <laughs> have learned the skills of of interviewing and and recording um, voices and putting together um, films, and not just myself, but you know, a number of us. And so my hope was that this would be the insp an inspiration to other people to do it, something similar. Um, I will say that, you know, being able to record voices right now is a convenient thing to do and probably a necessary thing to do. And, and even recording voices and images um, and stories that don't necessarily, maybe this is not the time to share them, but just to record voices and talk to people and and um, kind of archive their stories until you feel like it's the appropriate time to bring them out and share them. So while there's not another project right now for other tribes that, that we're working on um, or anybody on this panel is working on, I hope that this inspires other people. Yeah, and Mosaic Silicon Valley is always, uh, you know, we always wanna bring cultures and communities together. So we will do our part to support um, this endeavor. Uh, Miguel Angelis writes, I think that one of the important aspects of this project is the significance it put on the mundane or the common elder. Are there any other projects to document the everyday lives of Ohlone people currently? Not that I know of. <laughs> We're too busy living them to document them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think there is a project um, with the Amon Lutzen, but I'm not sure about that. Um, and Anne Marie was in a beautiful um, documentary that was released maybe two or three years ago um, that you can find online. I think it might even be on YouTube, but that's a project that uh, that's also out there. Um, and then Beyond Recognition is a film that Karina Gould uh, was part of and made as well. So those are some of the um, documentary projects uh, that you can find. We have a response from the audience and uh, Kirti Basindine. I, so, I, I apologize for the butchering of the last name. She says that I have started the Ohlone Elders and Youth Photography Project and they're actively looking for funding. Thank you, Kirti. Uh, Milian writes, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say uh, in the chat, uh, our, our one of our allies out there, Abel has posted uh, the link for both in the land of my ancestors, the uh, film that uh, Catherine just mentioned about Henry Sayers and also the uh, uh, posted the, the link for Beyond Recognition that Catherine also mentioned. Um, and we're gonna try and make all of these questions and answers available when we re-air this episode for an on-demand version on YouTube. Um, I think we have time for one last question and it's pertinent because uh, Ruth, you had mentioned language revitalization. And uh, so Milian writes, are there any opportunities for people to engage in supporting language revitalization efforts? Maybe Greg, do you, do you know that answer? <laughs> I, know that, I know it's happening and I know every summer there's incredible um, work at UC Berkeley. Um, right. Um, a, an organization that came out of UC Berkeley is called ICLES, Advocates for Indigenous California Language Survival. 
and um, a lot of uh, California communities, including a couple of the Loney communities have been supportive of, of it. Um, uh, uh, there are eight known dialects to the Ohlone language. Um, I believe there's three of them that actually have active work being done on them. Uh, Chochenyo, which is East Bay. Uh, Mutsin, which is a little south of the South Bay. Uh, that's Anne-Marie Sayers, the Yamamutsun area uh, of the lower Santa Clara County, uh, San Benito County, parts of Santa Cruz County. Um, and then Rumson uh, also has some work done it. That's the Monterey Bay area. Um, and it's done on a small scale, um, you know, so there, it's hard to kind of support that, but the Amamutsun, I believe, have a nonprofit uh, that supports their language efforts. Uh, Canyon from Indian Canyon uh, through Canyon Consulting, she's doing uh, some work for language restoration, so you can support her. Uh, she has some uh, coloring books and some other things that uh, for, for the Mutsun language. Um, certainly we're supporting ICLES, uh, which is a statewide organization, nonprofit. And uh, I believe uh, somebody had mentioned uh, Vince uh, earlier, Medina. I believe he's still on the board of directors for ICLES. Um, so that's a way to support the Ohlone and lots of California languages. Uh, which, will, which will benefit all uh, Ohlone people and everybody else too, because it's a lot of it is about learning the techniques of doing it. Um, a lot of it is immersion style. It's not, you know, uh, memorizing of lists like you learn Spanish when you're in fourth grade. Um, it's, it's immersion style and that's hard to do when you don't have any uh, native speakers, but it can be done. And several of the Ohlone dialects have been picked up that way and as well as other California languages have been relearned that way with no, um, uh, you know, original speakers left. Uh, so it can be brought all the way back, which they didn't used to believe could be done, but uh, Eichel's and lots of the California people have proven it's possible. So that's one way uh, to do it through Eichel's. I have a suggestion. Somebody should talk to Babel, the uh, language learning app. Charlene. <laughs> so um, that on my list. <laughs> Canyon writes, uh, adds to it. Uh, there's also acorn.wiki and then all California oratory resource network. Kirti writes, um, Quirina Luna Giri is teaching Mutsun. She's, um, she's, she's amazing uh, linguist. She's actually an educated linguist who uh, worked with a researcher from the University of Arizona to create the first English Mutsun language dictionary uh, mm -hmm. has been really instrumental in that in that uh, uh, language revitalization. And as far as I know, I think Mutsun is one of the most uh, documented native languages in the whole country. All right, we are at eight o'clock and we have had all of you for two hours. I wanna thank the audience um, first and foremost for staying with us this long. Uh, and each one of you, Charlene, Greg, Catherine, Terry, Marcus, Ruth, and Janet, for being such gracious co-hosts along with us. And a shout out and a deep felt gratitude to our co-sponsors, San Jose Museum of Art, Montalvo Art Center, and SV Creates for um, their funding. Uh, Mosaic Silicon Valley's next episode um, is uh, explores the traditions of remembrance in the Japanese and Mexican cultures in America. I've just posted the uh, link to that event on chat. Um, again, thanks so much to all of you. And uh, we look forward to working some more with you. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.